Hey, you guys ready to rock? Well, it's not a concert, so maybe don't rock. We, you're all eating. That's great. So uh, my name is Chris Cervani. I am with miracle Grow Aero Garden, and I'm really excited to be here with this um, panel today. We've got a lot of really awesome people who are um, going to share their stories, and um, I hope you all take away something from it. So first, just a couple words about Aero Garden. Uh, then we're going to introduce the panel, and then we're going to get going on the, on the fun stuff. So um, before I get into that, I, I, we work for um, miracle Grow and Aero Garden, and these are really cool countertop things. They're hydroponics. It all grows with, um, with no soil. It's just water, nutrients, and then light, of course, to uh, grow the plants. But the idea is that thinking about if you live here in the city and you don't have a lot of space to grow, check these things out. Um, we're working on making them smaller because we know that even now, like, even though they're small and compact, if you don't have a lot of space in your kitchen, you're not going to want to sacrifice maybe your coffee maker for one of these. We hope you will one day. Um, but also think about it in the living room because that's, I think that's the, also the really cool part about it. I mean, they're, they're fun to be around and they're great conversation starters. We were just talking about this um, lettuce up here and somebody was saying like, what, what's going on with the lettuce? Why is it turning brown? It's not, it's red lettuce. It's supposed to be starting to get that color on it. Um, but that's just part of the fun of hanging around plants, um, having green space in your life. I live in Ohio and uh, work with a team that's out here in New York. And so come back and forth quite a bit. I met up with one of my friends in Greenpoint the other night. And um, we were sitting out on our stoop, having a drink, looking at the tree that had just been um, dropped off. And I'm kind of just, to me, it's a street tree. In Ohio, I would have looked right past it. But she was so excited about the tree that's out in front and um, what it meant to her and the neighborhood and everybody that was around it. And, and that's the thing is, I realized as somebody who, I spent a lot of time around gardens and plants. I lead R&D um, for this group. And you know, I spent a lot of time with plants. For somebody like you, most of you, I'm sure, who live in the city don't spend a lot of time with plants, that's the exciting part about what I do, is bringing plants to you. And if we can do it with something like an arrow garden that allows you to grow plants anywhere, um, that one was actually grown in the basement at the office, so um, you can grow this literally anywhere. Um, that's really exciting, that's the fun part. But it's also I'm leading up to something that we're trying to do as, as a company. We're kind of separating ourselves off in a new group. We're calling ourselves the Hawthorne Garden Company. What we're trying to do is to look at urban gardening, get away from Scott's miracle Grow, who it's a great company. We're proud of our, our parent company, but we've been thinking about soil in the size of something that's the size of a pillowcase and, or a pillow for years, and that's how we sell stuff. But if you live in an apartment you can't, and you live in the city, you can't carry that on the subway. It's too hard to get around. And so we're thinking about ways to how do you garden in an apartment in New York City or anywhere that has um, small space, and we want to try to to help you out with that. Hydroponics is an awesome way to do it. I'm excited Raj is going to tell you some really cool stuff about hydroponics and the, um, what you can do with not having to haul soil around and uh, the great things that we can do with the same technology they used to grow plants on the space shuttle. You can have it in your home and there's nothing more um, local and that's how we tie back to sustainability and food and tech. Um, there's nothing more local than your backyard or your kitchen countertop. So you know, try to grow some herbs or some lettuce. It's really easy to do. Hit the button, add the nutrients, and that's all you really have to do. OK, that's enough about AeroGarden. Um, excited to introduce the panel today. So we have Aaron Zimmer from Good Eggs. I'm not going to steal all their thunder. They've got, these guys have really cool companies. They're going to want to tell you about them. So I'm just going to introduce their names and their, their companies. We have Aaron Zimmer from Good Eggs, Baraj Puri from Gotham Greens, Sean Dimon from Sea to Table. Really cool story about connecting with local fishermen. Will Horowitz from Ducks Eatery. I've not been to Ducks myself, but I, I have to go there because this is exactly the type of place I want to eat. Cajun Creole barbecue fusion, awesome. Um, Dorothy Nagel from Good Food Jobs. And she's got a really, she's our moderator and she's got a really cool um, company that she started connecting people who are looking for jobs in the food industry with the jobs that are out there. So um, awesome. Uh, it's great to be around people who do what they love. So Dorothy? Hi everybody, welcome. 
So glad to see everybody's got some eats here. Um, we're going to be motivated to power through this so we can get some eats as well. Um, I just wanted to say a thank you to Northside Media for um, bringing us all together in one place today. Um, my name is Dorothy Nagel. I'll be your moderator for the next 45 minutes or so. And then um, around 1 o'clock, 1 5, we'll turn it over to you guys um, to do my job and ask some questions. So get those questions ready. Nothing I love more than questions. Um, I, uh, in 2010, my business partner, Taylor Kokalis, came to me with an idea to um, start a job board for people who want to work in food, but not just any food jobs, um, the really dreamy jobs where people are changing the world and improving the environment and um, doing all that through sustainability and food culture. So that's sort of the lens through which we look um, at the jobs that we post. And because technology is a part of my daily work, um, Good Food Jobs is an online company, I'm really excited to talk to this group of folks today and um, direct the conversation a little bit selfishly, I hope. Um, so I'm going to briefly introduce our fabulous four here, not that they need any introduction, and then, uh, and then we'll go into some questions. Um, first up is Sean Dimon. He's in the family seafood business but he's making waves across the country. Um, he, at Sea to Table is a company that um, creates a direct connection from fishermen to chef by partnering with local fishermen from small scale, sustainable wild fisheries to find better markets for their catch. And Will Horowitz over here uh, owns Duck's Eatery, which is a small East Village restaurant described by New York Magazine as barbecue fusion. Will specializes in heritage techniques and ingredients with a strong focus on smoked, cured, and fermented foods. He learned to cook under his grandparents, who were chefs on both sides before he attended culinary school and opened Duck's Eatery. Erin, representing the ladies over here, Erin um, works for Good Eggs, and Good Eggs is really her grocery dream store come to life online. It's an ordering and delivery service which sources products from the best local farmers and food makers in San Francisco, Brooklyn, Los Angeles, and New Orleans. Their mission is to grow and sustain local food systems worldwide. And finally, at the end here, we have Viraj Puri. Um, his company is Gotham Greens, which is based right here in Brooklyn. And they design, build, and operate commercial scale greenhouses for vegetable production. Prior to founding Gotham Greens in 2008, Viraj worked for an environmental engineering firm, and his areas of expertise include green building, renewable energy, and environmental design. All right. So because I run a company um, that is uh, entirely web-based, um, but with a very personal human soul, I find myself thinking on pretty much a day-to-day -day basis, I kind of wish electricity had never been invented. Um, so Will and Sean, uh, you guys are the fishermen in the group, so I want to ask you first, can you relate to this idea that technology is both a blessing and a curse? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our business works with fishermen and fishing communities all around the country. Uh, as of this month, we're about 38 different supply locations, docks, where we have to communicate daily to figure out what they're landing, and figure out how to get it from the dock overnight to chefs, again, all around the country. And last year we shipped and delivered to over a thousand chefs. Technology can be a curse if you think about it as more than what it is, which is it's a tool. And there's lots of other tools in your toolkit. And what we do is we sell and deliver fish. So selling and delivering fish, you need boxes. You need trucks or you need a good third-party logistics partner to get it delivered. Sometimes you need a good can of whoop-ass to get things done. Technology can be an absolute blessing in that we don't just deliver fish, we, we deliver information. We tell the chef where the fish comes from, how it was caught, who caught it. And when you think about it, you gotta go and develop a new distribution path if you wanna do something that's different from the status quo. That takes technology, but it also takes a lot of hard work and a lot of brick and mortar. And um, what technology allows us to do is really once you build the path, is put more trains down that path. So it's a, it's a blessing and a curse. How about you, Will? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd have to agree. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I was telling them, but I just 
jumped in my car and flew over here. We had uh, the tourism board of Papua New Guinea send tribesmen that never left their tribe, been in the city, or on a plane that were expert pig smokers to come meet me at 5 in the morning to smoke hogs with me. So that's what I've been doing the past five, six hours. So excuse me if I'm a little drained. But, um, which actually is interesting because I was just spent the morning with people that really had no technology and were living in a whole other world. But, um, you so know, what did, they, what did they think of New York City? I mean, they, they, they were an adventurous bunch. They, they love it. But, you know, I mean, one guy's walking around in a headdress and no shoes around the East Village. And, Maybe that's kind of normal in the East Village, Village but, right? you know, it's, it was pretty funny nonetheless. And um, there's the story of technology and there's technology now. So for us, especially in the food world, so much of what we try to do and so much of our core beliefs are based around, and, and, and my background is, a lot of people know me here, but is, is sustainability. I went to Naropa Institute in Boulder, Colorado for sustainable. Uh, research and um, and Buddhism, but um, so with technology in the food world, so much of what everybody, including you know this great place here and so many places, trying to practice traditions, is get back to that pre-sliced bread era. And you know, I think technology has been an enormous convenience for us, but with that convenience has come you know very easily attainable greed, and and because of that. I think that people have forgotten how to live. And they've forgotten how to be self-reliant on themselves. They've forgotten how to cook, how to farm, how to fish, how to have a sustaining community. So, you know, that, that's a huge part of what we try to do, you know, with Toxidery or with all the other things that we're trying to do right now. And um, is trying to relearn how to live, how to culture our own butters, how to hang our own batargas, how to, cure our own hams, you know, how to ferment our own vinegars, how to really live sustainably and seasonally. And seasonally doesn't just mean going to the farmer's market and getting what's growing that day because you're going to be fucked in the winter, you know? <laughs> it's, it's, it's how to make products again, how to live a sustainable year-round life and support other people that, that do. And, and so now we're in that, this crux where we have a lot of cool people and a lot of people that get together for events like this and a lot of amazing companies that are supporting things like this and new companies that are starting to get into this. But how do you now evolve? And obviously, you know, maybe if you talked to me a couple of years ago back in Boulder, I'd say, let's all go back to being hunters and gatherers, but that's obviously not gonna happen. So what's the direction now? And the direction clearly is, obviously, is that we can't backtrack. And so how do we do the things that, you know, I'm just a chef in the kitchen, but so many of these people up here I'm on stage with are doing it in so much more intelligent ways, which is how do we combine these sustainable techniques and these self-reliance practices with modern day technology? And where do we go? And we don't have to know where we are going because it's, it's a question mark still. We don't know, that's why we're all here, I think. But that's the question, is how do we integrate and how do we move forward, you know? So, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Um, Aaron and Sean, your companies, like mine, probably would not even exist in the first place without the internet. Um, so we know how the internet has allowed and technology has allowed your businesses to survive, but um, Aaron, you go first and tell me a little bit about how it has allowed your company to thrive. How does um, technology support um, exploration and growth for you. Sure, totally. So um, Good Eggs in our New York food shed here, um, as Dorothy mentioned, we're in a four different regions across the country, but here I've, we're working with 150 different farmers and food makers, and each of them are at kind of a different size, a different uh, point in their business, and all of them have access to the technology that we built for them, the software that allows them to set up their own store in the Good Eggs marketplace. So they can set their availability limits if they have kind of a small availability that week because they're a really small producer, um, they have the, the technology to do that. So if their product sells out of our marketplace, it disappears and, and then they, they get to um, you know not have to deal with a lot of inventory management because we've set it all up for them. So it's really um, exciting to watch really small producers grow with us and for Good Egg's success, what it looks like is seeing all these producers grow with us. and. Um, like, for example, we work with this vegan yogurt maker. Her name is Anita. She makes this awesome coconut yogurt. She just started a few months ago, and Good Eggs was the very first um, 
uh, distribution service for her. So we delivered it to all these people across Brooklyn who were the very first people to try it. And now I've seen her in a bunch of stores all over the city. And um, it's really cool to be able to be building this robust platform that allows really small producers to get their products out there, try them out, be able to set those availability limits, add new products depending on the season. Um, so that, that software is very nimble and, and, and the platform is there for them to use. Um, and so every day they're going in there to check who their customers are, they have direct access to that customer information. And I think that's really um, important for uh, small producers to know who their customers are producers of any size, really, um, and just kind of disrupt that wholesale channel, which is a really long chain of different um, people involved in companies, and um, to be able to break that and just allow them to have direct uh, sale to their customer is really important. I, Aaron, I totally agree. It's about the connection, mm -hmm. and that's technology can really be the platform that provides that technology, that, that connection. Um, we started our business in a, a small fishing island in the West Indies called Tobago. And what we figured out how to do was take the catch from these fishermen and get it off the small island and actually get it to Trinidad and from Trinidad get it to New York City. In New York City, we figured out how to deliver it overnight to chefs. And what we'd have to do each day as the fish was landed and caught is we'd have to communicate what was available. We'd have to connect the island of Tobago with the chefs in New York. And this is five, six years ago, and I'm sure I was still behind the times, but we were text messaging black and white characters, and we were emailing, and we were calling, and we were trying to get the information as fast as possible from the ground to the market so that the market could decide what they wanted to buy on agreed upon price, and then we'd have to figure out how to deliver it. Uh, we've since grown, and we've figured out how to get to more and more fishing communities, and Technology is a platform that allows us to do that. What we do now is we have our fishing community's input on a daily basis, what's landed, how big it is, what they would like for an asking price. What we do with that is we add our packaging costs. We hook into a FedEx API system that allows you to get a real-time transportation cost from the point of landing to the point of delivery. We add our margins into that. And in real time, a chef can go onto a website and see the daily offerings from each of the fishing communities around the country and say, you know what, today I want golden tilefish from Montauk, or have some troll caught salmon from Neo Bay, Washington. And we're able to take that information and we're able to spread it out to a large market. And that's really our key to scalability is once you've built the road, once you've built the infrastructure needed, technology allows you to really push more down it. And we're in a really fun stage. So how, those uh, fishing communities, they have to have access to the technology as well, is that ever a challenge? You know, luckily I'm not the software developer or even the hardware developer, but almost everybody has a cell phone that has internet access. We've had to actually get some of our docs to put in a, a, uh, an internet connection. That's kind of a requirement of working with us. But once you have a basic internet connection, you can get emails, you can get digital faxes, you can get purchase orders, and you can also log into our system and report your daily catches. So the ones that are most sophisticated actually do it through a tablet that we provide on a, a piece of proprietary software. But um, you know we could be scratching off sale tickets and just working off landlines, but even, even the most remote fishing community is a little further past that. Yeah. Raj, I'm not leaving you out over there. I'm just, I'm so intimidated by your resume. I'm like, I'm like sweating trying to come up with a question for you. Um, so your greenhouse operation, which is the most basic uh, description for what Gotham Greens is, um, is sophisticated to say the least, and that's largely due to technology. Um, it's interesting to me that technology is fueling the production of local food in your case, um, when most often it's fueling the distribution of a more unsustainable food system that we're entrenched in now. So what are your thoughts on the potential for technology to make local food not just more accessible in terms of quantity and proximity, um, but also affordability. Can technology make sustainable food cheaper in a sustainable way? Um, absolutely. So our business uses a tremendous amount of technology, not sort of technology like the way these folks use it in the terms of sort of uh, IT or digital technology, but more actually agricultural technology. So just by way of background, when we created this concept for Gotham Greens, we wanted to be a part of the growing local food movement and all the positive attributes that it, that it represented. Um, addressing 
sort of macro issues, uh, uh, ecological and public health concerns surrounding conventional agriculture in terms of natural resource use, um, input of chemicals into the food system, and then long distance food transportation. Further, we wanted to address these uh, these trends um, affecting the food system, such as climate change, uh, population growth, and uh, rapid urbanization. So what we wanted to do was join sort of the community of um, uh, urban agriculturalists that were doing important work in community gardens and uh, rooftop farms and, uh, and, and educational gardens, but we wanted to take it a step further and do it on a commercial scale. Now, cities don't have a lot of arable land. We live in one of the most dense metropolitan areas in the world. We don't have a lot of fertile soil. We don't have uh, a lot of open space. But one vastly underutilized resource we do have is open rooftop space. So it's sort of found real estate. And in order to really grow food on a large scale, we had to turn to technology. So we use something known as controlled environment agriculture, which is well suited to an urban area. Uh, we have greenhouses that are climate controlled. Uh, we've got sensors and controls that monitor the uh, daily climate conditions and light levels and CO2 and oxygen. And all that information is fed to a computer control system that then turns on fans and, and, and pumps and, and different uh, things to keep the optimal growing conditions for the plants. And as a result, we're able to grow um, a lot of plants based on our footprint. So our greenhouses measure about an acre, but we produce uh, crops equivalent to about a 20 acre farm. And it allow allows us to produce food year round without um, using any sort of chemical pesticides by capturing all of our irrigation water for reuse um, uh, and, and a lot of other positive environmental attributes. So to answer your question now, Dorothy, that was, a, that was just sort of context. By being able to grow food on a commercial scale, we're able to achieve economies of scale, which allows us to have our food at a lower price point than, um, than food that's grown on a really small scale sometimes. Uh, in addition to that, we're due to our proximity to the end user, the end customer, we're able, we're able to cut out a lot of the long distance uh, logistics and the transportation associated with food production. Once our lettuce or, or basil is, is, is harvested in California or Mexico, it has to be packed up and then transported three or 4,000 miles to get to the consumer. Uh, not only do you have that impact um, uh, of the transportation of that, of that food, but you're also compromising the quality, the taste, the nutrition, and the flavor. So by growing it in closer proximity to the end customer, we're able to boost those, the, the, those ideas. So we're able to basically be competitive um, with our price points uh, based on the uh, fact that we're able to achieve economies of scale, which are achieved through uh, implementation of technology. Um, so yeah. So, and labor, I think, is also a big part of that picture of affordability, so I'm curious. Um, the labor is, I think, less time consuming in your operation than it would be, for example, in a large field, right? Or tell me a little bit about how that works. How many people do you employ to harvest and how does the harvesting work? Yeah, it certainly is still labor intensive. One of the things we're most proud of actually is creating jobs. Um, from a business side, it's you know, a huge payroll, but, um, but from sort of an economic development perspective and green job creation, we're really proud that we've created over 50 jobs, full-time um, jobs here in New York. So um, it definitely reduces uh, the technology, enables us to reduce some of that technology, but everything is still uh, hand harvested, hand packaged. Oh, I'm sorry, I got distracted. I thought you were looking at me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so everything is still hand harvested, hand packaged, uh, distributed. So the technology definitely does reduce some of the labor. Um, and as we scale up, I think more automation will, 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 will be featured into this, uh, you know, in terms of conveyor belts and more sort of uh, automation in the facility. But for now, a lot of it's done by hand. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, will, as a chef, you work with your hands. So to a certain extent, um, messy fingers prohibit you from having the iPhone at your side all the time, right? So tell us how you use technology in the kitchen. Um, <clears throat> no, I use it. I just have to buy new iPhones quite often. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, what you were saying, actually all, all three of you, uh, in terms of kind of knowing, also a, a sense of what you guys do is knowing, allowing us as consumers or chefs to know where we're getting our product from. It's really important. Uh, we, we haven't really gotten to do that for about 70 years. So that's huge for us. 
you know, one of the most important things for us about cooking and you know, doing our best to do it well is our connection to the food. Um, and by our connection, yes, the customer, absolutely. We, we hope that they have a connection to the food. But physically, the chef and the line cook, the dishwasher cleaning shrimp, whatever it is, knows where that food came from and, and, and why it's there and who made it and how it got there and everything about it. And that their appreciation and connection to that food is, is enormous for us. But, you know, truthfully, technology for us, I mean, yeah, we use a million different things. I have, you know, two giant cold smokers, you know, hooked up to aquarium pumps on timers that connect to my iPhone. You know, like we have, you know, a million different things that are, that are computerized, even with the sustainable and heritage techniques that we do. But the biggest thing for us is, is interconnectedness. I'd say that's the biggest, and that's a very general thing, especially to be doing, to be talking about somewhere like here. Um, but, you know, all the social media crap that everyone gets to see too, but I'm sure a lot of people here love, and, and all that stuff in general, all the interconnectedness, what we want, the most we can possibly do is do the best we can in the kitchen and love what we can and be passionate about what we do and share that with people. I mean, our, our goal for sustainability is that there's an incredible amount of techniques out there and, and sus between sustainable farming, construction, all these different things going on and fishing. But if we could figure out a way to do what we do and spark people in their day-to-day -day life to go outside and be mystified by the universe again, get that spark, just be mystified by growing a plant and what it takes and how it gets to your, your kitchen counter and how it feeds your kids, to be mystified by that and to be appreciative of that is our spark. And that's what we want to share with people is, is to be appreciative about what's on your plate. Start looking at fish on your table with a head on it again. Start looking at food and, and appreciating every single part of it and really knowing where it came from and what went into that environmentally and from the farmer's hands and from the chef's hands onto your plate. And getting back to that because there's a million different things we could do, but there's also giant, giant companies and giant governments and giant things working against us. So, I mean, this takes, you know, and this isn't just for food. This is for medicinal stuff. This is for all this. It's, it takes that type of self-reliance. And for us, that self-reliance is through that spark of excitement. And, and that's what we want. That's what we're trying to spread is, is that's the core for us, is, is getting that. Because when you do spread there, when you do sit here and hopefully talk about it, even though obviously you guys have been listening to me, I, I babble quite a bit, is that hopefully if a couple people can spread that spark and be mystified again by this plant growing, that the goal is, is that spreads like wildfire. And that's the strongest thing we have, and that's the biggest key to the entire interconnectedness of technology as a whole for us. So yeah. Wow. <laughs> so I could keep asking questions. I'm tempted to, but I'm I'm gonna let you guys uh, have a chance to ask. Um, so I'm gonna stand up just so I can see people. Um. Sure. Questions about hydroponics. So we uh, grow using a technique called hydroponics, which is similar to what this Aero Garden is doing. So uh, the reason we turn to hydroponics is that cities don't have a lot of good good quality soil. In fact, we have very contaminated soil here in New York. Technically, a plant doesn't need soil to grow. What it needs is sunlight, it needs oxygen, it needs water, it needs CO2, and it needs nutrients. So nutrients are things like nitrogen, potassium, magnesium, selenium, things that are found um, typically in soil through decomposing organic matter. Um, through modern agriculture now, those uh, nutrients have to often be added in the form of fertilizer, whether organic or inorganic. Um, for hydroponics to work, what you do is you dissolve the nutrients in the water itself, and then that water provides uh, the nutrition to the crops. So we use organic nutrients um, at Gotham Greens. Um, about 95% of our nutrients are, are, are organic, and a couple of them that are not sort of water-soluble enough um, come from um, their more synthetic fertilizer, about 5%. Now, one of the biggest issues with synthetic fertilizer is obviously the fossil fuel use that goes into the, 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 the production of those fertilizers. Um, 
but is also the, the enormous amount of it that's used. And how that happens is when you apply fertilizer to soil or in agriculture, uh, and then when you irrigate those crops or it rains, all that nutrition is going to fall by gravity. It's going to fall below the soil level into the watershed. Using techniques that we have at Gotham Greens, we recirculate all of our irrigation water. So those nutrients are actually captured and then they're recycled over and over and over again. So the water that we use now is the same water we've used three years ago. We use that same water over and over and over again. So we're not releasing any of that fertilizer into the watershed, which is the leading cause of global water pollution. It's not, a, it's not sort of um, uh, industry or domestic water use um, or manufacturing. Agriculture is the leading source of global water pollution. It leads to these massive dead zones in our watershed, like in the Gulf of Mexico. You have this you know, huge dead zone, which is caused by fertilizer, synthetic fertilizer coming down the Mississippi into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and then it leads to these algae blooms because the sunlight hits the water, it creates these huge algae blooms, uh, it takes up all the oxygen, and, um, and then the fish die, and it's basically unproductive watershed. So uh, viewing it through that lens, we use just literally teaspoons of some of these nutrients, and we're able to recycle them over and over and over again. So um, that's how we're able to sort of meet our sustainability um, uh, mission. Yeah, absolutely. There's a question about B Corp which we've been a B Corp uh, for a couple of years already. And what a B Corp allows you to do is it allows you not just to be responsible to your shareholders, but your stakeholders. And that really allowed us to look at our mission in our business and put it into our bylaws. And of course we make a profit, but we understand that our business affects a lot of people along the chain. It affects chefs, hopefully getting them a better product. It also affects fishermen, getting them a better market for their product. Um, we remind ourselves of that every day, and we're, we're big fans of the B Corp. And one of the themes I, I keep hearing popping up talking with you guys is that you know, we're, all, we're all in this new food revolution. We're all really trying to do something different, and it's, it's exciting. It's a really exciting place to be, and Brooklyn's a really fun place to be in it. You get to bump against these guys, and you know, Aaron and Good Eggs are taking people out of traditional retail. You're not going to a supermarket anymore. You have a way to get really good ingredients and products directly to your home bypassing a bottleneck of a multinational corporation or basically someone who's a gatekeeper telling you what you can and can't buy because we either stock it or don't. Um, Raj is figuring out how to get produce more local. Will is bringing people more connected to heirloom techniques and ingredients. This can't be done without technology and I'm you know, I'm, I'm surprised I'm here because I'm a bit of a Luddite, but it, it's becoming evident that the only way we can do these things, the only way we can create a more direct connection between our producers and our consumers is through technology. It's creating an efficiency that takes a lot of the older players out of the market, and it's giving a lot of people an option. So I thank you so much for letting me sit here with these guys. One thing I can say is that um, Good Eggs really started um, in as a technology company. Like our two founders are both coming from Silicon Valley. They were both uh, in the tech community before. Um, but what they didn't realize is how important distribution is to this whole uh, food economy. And, and they realized very soon once they started Good Eggs and, and started talking to farmers and producers that it was really getting the product that last mile to the customer. So whether it's produce or whether it's um, you know fish or, or meat or whatever, uh, getting getting the food to the customer was like one of the biggest barriers for these um, producers. So, uh, Good Eggs became a distribution company, sort of. Um, I mean, we're we're kind of the whole package. Uh, we're this we're this online platform. We're delivering directly to the customer. We're receiving directly from the producer. We're making it easier for them to be able to um, deliver to our hub. So, in some cases, we work with farms upstate, and you know they have hundreds of miles to travel. In some cases, into the city, and we have a hub upstate where they can drop off, so that we can at least eliminate some of those miles that they're coming into the city and funnel it into. A farm up there and then we pick up from them so um, I think just making sure that uh, you know driving in a truck all day and going across the country is not how we just rely on how food gets everywhere if we can kind of uh, centralize it in certain hubs in local food sheds uh, then it's much more viable for everyone involved um, 
Uh, absolutely. I, I, you know, I agree with everything you said. And in the kitchen, I can speak for myself that, you know, I spoke about this last time, is that, you know, one of the things we're trying to do is become a no-waste kitchen. Um, so, you know, if you're looking at these techniques that we're looking at, which are all, you know, based themselves on traditional homesteading techniques, and um, not from any specific region, though we are here, so we do a lot from here, but really everywhere in the world, obviously, most of this technology, um, like, you know, iPhones and this and that, let alone refrigeration, is really fairly new. Um, so going back to studying those techniques where if you need to survive, the idea of waste is just like, you might as well just kill yourself. So that, that's, that's an important part for us, is that, is that working with, not just in the kitchen, but also working with farmers and fishermen or whoever it is to take products or take parts of products that they can't seem to sell. Take, you know, the carrots that aren't formed correctly and they can't put into market. Take all these type of things and say, listen, you don't have to, that doesn't have to be, you know, hog feed. We'll take it from you. You know, we'll take it and we'll make something really cool. And I spoke about this last time, which is, you know, some of our most known dishes. We, we actually got one of the top new dishes of the year in New York and in the country for a whole smoked goat neck this year. Um, and, and so doing things like that, if we have, you know, leftover cream that's going to turn, then obviously it gets smoked and then churned into butter and cultured and, and buttermilk. And if we have leftover meat, you could sure as hell imagine that it's gonna be turned into some sort of boudin that's gonna get hung and cured for the next four months or on your plate the next morning. So the idea of using these techniques is, you know, technology is, is a huge piece of this. It's enormous, it's the, it's the wheel that's gonna turn this. But all these questions have already been answered. All the people have been doing this for way longer than, than, than these have been problems. Um, you know, and so all those homesteading techniques are what is keeping us going. And, and it's the idea of going towards that, that, that sustainable model in terms of the kitchen. And not only that, but by using these things, we get to serve food that we really, really think is cool to people that are on the same budget as us. <laughs> which is awesome because we, that's what we want. You know, we want people to come into our restaurant that might have dropped, you know, $800 for themselves at Masa the night before, but can drop $30 for themselves in the East Village and, and, and have the same incredibly interesting techniques and things like that. You know, I came from, you know, Michelin three-star restaurants around the world in really top places. And... You know, these are the type of places where you get a bag of 20 pounds of micro red ribbon sorrel and you might use six ounces because they make you sit there and peel through each one to see which is the, red, which is the right one to so serve on that plate, you know, and, and, and how it grew and how the wind hit it while it was grew and what direction is it. And, you know, it's like, it's like what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> like, well, seriously, it's like where did the soul of it go? Where did the core of it go? You know, and even if you want that perfect piece of micro sorrel, why isn't the other one going into a sorrel soup? You know, why is it just being tossed? So, you know, these are, these are important things. Viraj and Sean, you guys both deal with um, perishable product. So can you talk a little bit about waste from, from that perspective? Yeah. Um, sure. Uh, yeah, waste is obviously a huge issue. Um, and yeah, we, we deal with perishable things. So... Uh, Things like grains that can be stored for long periods of time, it can be stored dry and shipped dry, are often, um, uh, you know, best suited to, to kind of, you know, they, they have that advantage. Uh, highly perishable products, there's an enormous amount of shrink using sort of industry lingo. So by growing it in really close proximity and just-in-time delivery, often the stuff that we harvest is uh, delivered to a grocery store or to a restaurant that same day or the next day. So we're passing on that, you know, two weeks of shelf life onto the end consumer, which reduces shrink, as opposed to more conventional products that, say, come from California or Mexico that are probably already a week old by the time you get it. So absolutely, I think you hit the nail on the head with waste being... Um, one of the biggest issues in the agricultural system and food production. The other uh, thing that I will mention um, that I think 
is being addressed, but perhaps not um, swiftly enough, is the access of healthy food to people. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're facing a lot of public health issues concerning diet-related diseases, whether it's obesity or diabetes, and a lot of it just comes down to access to food. Uh, you, you may have heard of this notion, this term called food deserts which for people who are not familiar with is essentially refers to areas that just simply don't have grocery stores that sell fresh products. So I think a big challenge, and it is being addressed through you know, um, politicians, uh, urban planners, public health advocates, um, Michelle Obama, you know, various, a lot of people are addressing it, Jamie Oliver, you know, well-known people like that, but we need to act on it more swiftly. There's so many inner city residents uh, and kids who have no idea what a fresh vegetable looks like. So I think that's uh, an area in the food system that needs to be addressed um, with more urgency. Yeah, I would definitely agree on food deserts, figuring out how to get food to, to the places where it's not, but waste is the number one. In our, in, in our office, in our work, waste is the sin. Like, you just don't, you don't waste. If a chef got a cut he didn't like or this or that, you, you work with that chef. You try to figure out how to get him to use it. Um, not everybody's as, as good as Will and, and forgotten technologies. But uh, what we're doing to combat it is, unlike produce, fish can actually be very well frozen. And that's something that people have a, a poor uh, preconception about in that you know, traditionally seafood, you know, you go and put it in your cart and you go and you hawk it on the street, fish, fish. You don't sell it one day, you don't sell it two days, you don't sell it three days, freeze it. Whereas what we're doing now is we're working with boats that have onboard freezing technologies and an upfront investment from that fisherman. And we work with land-based processors that have the ability to uh, both IQF in flash tunnels and, and blast freeze things down to negative 30, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And what that does is it allows you to really capture something at the peak of freshness. And that's something I think people are catching on to now is that uh, frozen can be fresher than fresh. And that if you grab something, if you are going berry picking, or if you're able to grow berries on a roof, that really you're gonna have a big bumper crop for a short period of time, and you're gonna have a window to sell that. But if you can really capture that value right then and there at that point, and you can store it and hold it at a very low temperature, you take it out and you, you refresh it, you defrost it 12 months later and it is just as good and it's got the nutrients in place and that's really our attack into the consumer market and the institutional market where through good eggs we only sell frozen fish. People have the ability to buy Massachusetts monkfish or Rhode Island squid and we're not going to try to match the fresh market with a, a finicky co consumer demand. We're going to blast freeze that at a very, very low temperature, it's super high quality product, put it into a consumable form, and then figure out how to get it most efficiently to market, which at this point in New York City is not going through a traditional retailer, but allowing someone like Good Eggs to deliver it to your home along with some you know, uh, lettuce from Gotham Green. I, you know, I think it's interesting when I hear the words fresh too, is, is this idea of what is fresh. Yeah. You know, which for me as a chef is a huge, huge, piece of it because I, I, I do go to the market every day and I do do these things and work with farmers, but at the same time, if you look at some of the top restaurants in the world right now, they might take a fresh carrot and hang it in their closet for six months before they put it on the plate. Or they might take a tuna in a, Japan a big, a big and, they in might, uh, and they might let it sit for you know, a certain amount of days until it's really at the opportune time temperature to really serve at the top places in the world. But you know, the interesting thing is that and this is why I think it's so important of you know doing things like this and getting different groups of people like here involved together is that it takes everybody to do this and you have to know where it's coming from. You have to have easier access to get to people and you have to also teach people how to make this stuff rather than going to McDonald's. Um, I will say that the way that Good Eggs really works hard to eliminate food waste is that Unlike a grocery store where you'll go shopping and see stuff that's been sitting on the shelves for who knows how long, um, we're receiving fresh product the morning that it's going out to be delivered. Um, in many cases, it's uh, it was just ordered, you know, two nights before, and then our producers get that information of their orders, and then they are able to give us exactly what we're going to be delivering for those days. So we're not holding on to a bunch of extra inventory. Um, we have a zero waste model, so everything that comes in is going out the door with my own company that gets sort of trickled down. There's Instagram photos that I put online and people who follow us see, you know, are getting inspired by that, whatever. You know, there's lots of different little ways to, to network now and technology helps us with that. And so 
um, for me, it's sort of about two, two things, doing the thing that you believe in and then also helping to kind of just get it out there a little bit. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not happening overnight. Um, but another great thing about technology is that all of these entrepreneur-minded people, it's allowed them to live their dream and create these amazing companies that are affecting people, including you guys, creating a company that's affecting people on a daily basis. And um, it can be disheartening. Um, I often read articles by environmental journalists and I just think, you know, how do these guys get up every day when they know what's happening to our planet? But um, it's, it's trying to keep going on a day-to-day -day basis.